Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Paul, and I am a nerd. And here you are at the August 2016 TAVS 3 Virtual User Group meeting, where today we are fortunate enough to be talking about how to enter EFT transactions in accounts payable. Mary Jo is going to give you some insight on that and the benefits of upgrading to Platinum. For those of you who may be considering it, I'm going to talk more about those. So, without any further ado, I'm going to press several magic buttons here and give Mary Jo control in accounts payable so she can tell us all about how to enter those manual EFT transactions. Okay, so we all have those times when we need to keep track of things in AP that don't necessarily need to come out of the bank account how with a check. We're not going to print a check out. We're actually going to just enter these transactions, whether it's, you know, for uh, an electronic transfer that we've done, an automatic payment that comes out, uh, credit cards, things like that that we need to do. So how we can keep track of that in accounts payable is by creating another bank account in accounts payable that points to our cash account. So it's still going to point to the same bank account in General Ledger, but we can create as many bank accounts as we want to in accounts payable that point to that same ledger account to accommodate for all of these different things that we might have to do. So I'm going to look at our setup here uh, where we set up our bank accounts in accounts payable and look at what we have in here now. So right now we have two. This is sample data. So number one is first bank. So if I look at First Bank, it is set up to any time I write a check or print a check to credit the operating account, which in this instance is 1110, and it would debit then whatever account I pick on that general ledger screen. So if I set up another account for First Bank and name it like First Bank slash manual check or manual check slash EFT, whatever it is that would make sense for you, um, and point it to that same account, we would in turn just be crediting that account and then debiting any of those other individual things. But we can give it a check number that's just totally different. It, can, it doesn't matter. We can start at one because in this instance, it's not real checks that we're printing. So it really doesn't matter where we start those checks from. Now, I've seen it done two different ways. I start just starting at one and just going forward. Uh, we know that our check numbers are going to start much higher than one, so they're never going to catch up. Or... I have had firms that will do, you know, like 999 and start their check numbers there and then, you know, or, or 99999, you know, some high number so that they know that they're never going to get there the other way. So really that is a personal preference you can do with the firm. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and set up one of these bank accounts to show you how that works. So the first thing we're going to do is just hit new and it'll be number three. And I'm just going to name this one first bank. Um, and we will put this dash manual checks. And that way we'll know this is the one that we're going to pick um, every time we use manual checks and have that happen. I'm going to leave it at zero, so my next check number will be one, but I'm going to point it to that same 1110 account uh, in AP and save it. And now if I go over to do an invoice for one of these electronic transfers, I'm going to just pick this particular one here for this court. We will do tab. And we'll just do this for $100. Well, the filing fee is fine. Down here with this bank account, I'm going to move this down just a little bit more. We're going to make sure that we pick manual check up here. But for the bank account for this one, I'm going to choose that new account that I made for the manual checks. And it goes ahead and defaults this to number one for my check. Put the date in there. Again, this is sample data, so we're back in like 2014. Um, and then on the general ledger screen, I'm going to do the same thing I'd always was. This is client cost advance for $100. Save it. Do the big save up here. And I'm not going to bill a client for this particular one, but you could. And then it's in there. So now I have this manual check. If I come down here that has that one, it's already been processed. I'm not going to print a check. But when I post this, it's going to go right over to the bank account just like I had printed the check and put, taken it out of there. So that's how that can work for different electronic fund transfers, anything I'm not physically going to print a check for. 
I can keep track in there. And I can keep track of multiple bank accounts. So if you've got another bank account that you're doing this with, um, or you, know, you can set up a second one for that one as well. So maybe you have an operating, maybe you have a payroll, maybe you have whatever. You can set up multiple bank accounts in AP. It doesn't mean you're creating new bank accounts in your general ledger and keeping track of different balances over there. It just means here in AP, we're going to point that to a different place. Paul? Huh? Well, let's talk about the fact that you could just put it in as a manual check over in the other bank account. Why wouldn't you do that? Well, if your check numbers then would be mixed up. So if I have this in, in you know, if I have a, um, my, my bank account for the first one is going to have, if I pick number one, it's going to have a check number of like 2,000, 25, whatever that was. That was like 2,000 something. And I would have to know or keep track manually of what my check number is for my next um, EFT transaction. So maybe I started at one uh, to add that EFT in and then I wanted to put in the next one of these. I'm going to have to go back and forth and try to figure out what the next check number is. So it could be very difficult to keep track and monitor what that is. But if I have a separate bank account to do it, it'll always know that the next check number for this manual check entry is going to be two, three, four, five, and it would just keep track of that separately. Of course, you know, Mary Jo, that was a loaded question because we yes. used to do it that way. Yes. And we actually had a very convoluted system of trying to keep track of what the next manual check mm -hmm. number was and then letting the system keep track of the next regular mm -hmm. check number. And it was kind of a mess. Um, so, was. yeah, you could do that. Another mistake that people so uh, frequently make that's even more of a problem is they just leave the manual check number at zero, which seems at first like a good idea, right, Mary Jo? Mm -hmm. tell, us, tell us what can happen. <laughs> just put me on the spot, Paul. What could happen? Well, if you have it at zero, you're going to have lots and lots of checks out there that are, have a check number of zero. And if you ever have to void a check number, and if you've ever done this before, and all of these check numbers are zeros, you void all of the check numbers that are zero, not just the one that you're thinking. So it can be very hard to That's keep track what I was of. Thinking of. So. Now, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, or maybe we don't know, I think they may have actually fixed that to some extent, but it, it depends on what version of the software you're running. If you're still mm -hmm. running a version where that's not the case, that can mm -hmm. be a problem too. So mm -hmm. that's another thing to be aware of. Uh, mm -hmm. We first started really getting into this when um, we started using the debit card a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, instead of using a credit card, we were using a debit card, which was great because you could uh, you could only spend the money that you had in the bank account, but <laughs> it also created all these manual checks that had to be put in. But there are a lot mm -hmm. of things. I mean, a lot of people are being paid these days electronically. Mm -hmm. They're being paid by EFTs or they're being paid by wires. Uh, you've mm -hmm. got things that come out of your bank automatically these days, and this is the way to do it, very efficient way to do it. And really all you're doing is setting up that separate bank account. Mm -hmm. uh, not a separate bank account. That's the thing. That's why people say a separate bank account. I don't want a separate bank account. No, a separate bank account and accounts payable that points to the same bank account in GL. Very cool. Thank you, Mary Jo. I am going to talk about, uh, oh, hold on a second. Leanne said we have a question. Leanne, do we have a question? Yes. The question is, why would you do it this way with the manual check when you could do a regular journal entry? Ah, okay. Uh, Mary Jo's dialing back in. We're having phone trouble here today. So Mary Jo's on her way back in, so I'll answer that. You, you can do it with a regular journal entry. Um, but then you don't have the ability to track things that you need to track by vendor. For instance, if the manual check that you're processing was to a certain vendor that you then need to produce 1099 to, um, you're out of luck because that data is not in accounts payable. And you also can't take advantage of the accounts payables mechanisms and reports that are in place to be able to report on things by vendor. Show me all the checks we wrote to this vendor. Show me all the checks we've done to this range of vendors. Or being able to move things from one vendor to another. You lose that accounts payable based management of vendors that you get. Yes, it is true that you can simply put a manual check into GL, but you lose uh, the ability to do certain things that are accounts payable related because you're circumventing accounts payable mm -hmm. and putting it straight into GL. And one other thing, sometimes um, at some firms, the way that the staff hierarchy is set up is some have access to accounts payable, but they do not have access to the general ledger to put in journal entries. So this gives you that added security mm -hmm. that you could keep people out of 
the general ledger and have them just be sticking to accounts table as well. So Correct, because you can, you, can, you can limit certain things that people can go into in GL, but once you give them access to the journal, you can't say, oh, they can go into the journal, but they can only see these accounts. That's not a, a level of um, security that we're able to put in place. Mm -hmm. So it's either an all or nothing sort of thing. If they can go to the journal, they can also see payroll related or other income related accounts that maybe they're not supposed to see. Mm -hmm. Okay, Tom. Okay. Well, I now will switch over to Platinum. And, and I'm not trying to sell you Platinum. Um, if you're happy with the software that you have and the way that it's working, uh, that if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But some people do, um, <laughs> I think I interrupted Leanne while she was trying to contact our telephone company. <laughs> there we go. Some people do have a need for some of the things that are in, in Platinum. And so one of those things uh, is, is speed. Another is reports. Uh, another is security. Now, those things, some of those things don't sound as exciting as others, but I think they all are significant. So how do you find out, first off, of what I'm going to talk about? You go to tabs3.com. And to get to this Platinum page that talks about all these benefits, you can go to Products, Platinum Versions, and you will end up on this page. And it gives you a synopsis, a very uh, high-level synopsis at first, and then you can drill down for details of what these things mean. So we're going to talk specifically about the things that are in tabs that are benefits of Platinum. We're not going to worry about the ones that have to do with uh, Practice Master. Now, I will tell you about Tabs 3 Connect only because you can have it even if you just have tabs. Uh, tabs 3 Connect is really six functions that are practice management oriented. Um, calendars, matter manager, contacts, time entry, cost entry, and clients. Okay. Now, time entry isn't really specifically a practice master thing. And so, Right after they released this, a lot of people said, well, wait a minute, I, I, I don't want to have to have Practice Master to use Tabs Reconnect. So they allow you to enter time using Tabs Reconnect if you only have tabs. If you have Practice Master and you have Platinum and you have tabs, you already have Tabs Reconnect. It's there. It's free of charge. It doesn't cost you anything. But if you just have tabs and you just want to enter time, you can get what's called a Tabs Reconnect subscription for $60 a year, and people can be able to enter time. And so what that means is, you can go to uh, a fee entry screen, and I'm going to actually just take you into ours real quick and show you. And I'm going to authenticate. And this one takes me straight into a fee. So I can go up here and specify, oh, let's say Purdue Law Offices. So I can type Purdue. That's our pretend client. And it knows it's today. It knows who I am because I'm logged in, so I don't even need a timekeeper number. All I need to do is say 0.2 hours telephone call with Dave. Hit save. And as soon as you get this blank screen back, that's there. Now, keep in mind, I'm accessing this through a browser. I could be in line at Starbucks. I could be accessing it kind of as an app on my phone or my iPad. I can access it through a browser at home. I can be anywhere. As long as I've got an internet connection, I can be adding time into tabs. If that's something that's interesting to you, then for $60 a year, if you only have tabs and you don't have Practice Master, or for free, as long as you've got Platinum and you have Practice Master and tabs, you have this capability. Uh, to a lot of people, that right there is the main and only reason that they get Platinum. But there are other reasons. So I'm going to go back over here to the FCI website, and I'm going to go back a screen. I'm going to talk about the others. Uh, hot backup. If you've ever tried to do something that you really should back up your software before you do it, uh, you're going to make some massive change. You're going to update statements. You're going to do whatever. Um, Hot backup will allow you to back up your software while people remain in the software. Now, some of the things that you're doing that you need a hot backup, you're going to kick people out to do. 
but you don't necessarily have to kick them out of practice master. So if you're going to do something that requires everybody to get out of tabs and you want to back up the data, but you want them to still be able to be in practice master, a hot backup will allow you to back up your data while everybody keeps working. And then once the data is backed up, uh, you can go ahead and do whatever it is you're going to do knowing that you've got a good backup. But even better is this thing called auto recovery. Auto recovery means if you have a hiccup in the middle of a transaction or group of transactions, let's say you're updating just a single statement for a single client, seems like a simple thing, but there are a lot of files that are open. There's the, the ledger file, the fee file, the archive file, the cost file, the client file, all these things are open with records being edited or created or deleted, moved around, should we say. And so if you're in the middle of doing that one thing and the power goes out or your network has a hiccup, some sort of a, a network problem that you may not even be aware of yet, um, usually without platinum, you'll, you'll know because the power will go back out and you'll come back in, you won't be able to get into software, maybe you'll get an error message, and you have to restore from the backup. With auto recovery, what it does is when these things are happening, it takes a picture right before, makes sure that it gets done right, and if it doesn't, it automatically puts it back the way it was before the thing that you started to do. You don't have to worry about this happening. You don't have to worry about telling it to do this. It just happens. So the bottom line is safety, safety of your data, safety of the all the, the information that you have in the system being intact when you're done doing whatever it is you're doing. And I'm just going to interject really fast because I will tell you, hot backup and auto recovery are uh, one of, I, I would say, the, the number one thing. Um, I mean, there's so many good things about Platinum, but I can't tell you how many times I've had clients call that they were in the middle of updating statements and something happened, whether it was the power went out. Um, I had a lady that accidentally kicked her power strip underneath her desk in the middle of updating statements, killed the power on her machine, lost everything had to restore from a backup and depending on when your backups are whether it was an internal backup in tabs or whether your IT makes a nightly backup or not that's the time you find out whether they've actually been working and it's usually too late and unfortunately when that happens there's nothing else that we can do besides restore from a backup so it's huge that is a huge thing and, and so many people don't do it because they have to get everybody out to do it and it's such a pain um, they can only update at certain times of the day that in itself is such a time saver. So Yeah, I agree, and I appreciate your pointing that out. But sadly, that's not the reason most people get platinum. They don't, True. They, they don't think of that until it hits them, until they kick the power button while they're, mm -hmm. while they're updating statements. Yeah. Uh, I, I know that we've and had usually, some firms that have to go back two, three, four weeks. Oh, yeah, and I've had them with months, actually months that they've lost. So, you know, it, it is very important. And, you know, a lot of times those are the things that your support staff, so attorneys, if you're listening, your support staff are doing these daily tasks that they need to do um, that really can affect your system, and they need to be able to do these backups, <laughs> but they can't because mm -hmm. either your firm is so large, so many people are in, whatever that may be, so on their side of it, this is a huge thing, mm -hmm. um, and, and all, overall for your firm, obviously. But And a lot of these other things that Paul's going to talk about are great. They're great bells and whistles. They are wonderful features that are really going to help you as well. But this is a, a really um, – It's important. It's a protection it's your of your data. Exactly. Yeah. It's protecting your data. Um, this here is the number one reason people get platinum accelerated. Okay? It is – it is faster reports. Let's say, for instance, that you're printing a cash receipts report uh, and you've been doing it um, you know, every day when you do a deposit for 10 years and your system has gotten bigger and bigger and more data, more ledger records, more. It, your firm's growing, your system's growing, your data's growing, and it's gotten to the point where that report can take an hour, maybe an hour and a half to run. You've gotten used to going to lunch and just before you go to lunch, turning that report on and coming back and having it still be running. Um, that report, if it takes an hour, will take probably about a minute or two once you get platinum. I'm not going to go into great detail. Let's just say it has to do with the architecture and how the data is being back, passed back and forth between the server and your workstation. Okay, And what happens is a 30 to 45 time, not percent, time increase uh, in the speed of, of printing of reports. 
So if you're printing a certain report and it takes only two minutes, a big deal. It's going to take you know five seconds. I guess that's significant. But there are reports as you get bigger and bigger, the firm grows, the data grows, the system's been used more and more years that can get where they take a half an hour, an hour or longer. And those are going to be extremely fast and extremely noticeable. That speed difference can be extremely noticeable. And one other thing that has to do with tabs is because of the speed of the reports, it's not possible in the regular multi-user version to do what we call an AR by working timekeeper. We can print accounts receivable in any tabs program, any version, that says Bob's matters have this much in accounts receivable and here they are, and George's matters have this much accounts receivable and here they are listed out. But we, if, if George did work on one of Bob's matters, he's not going to see it on his list. And if Bob did work on one of George's matters, they're not going to see that on their list. And so what we're getting at is a situation where the, the, the ability to print a report and print it fast is enhanced enough that we can now do one by working timekeeper. So working timekeeper accounts receivable simply means what work did I do that hasn't been paid for yet as opposed to what work was done for my clients that hasn't been paid for yet. Um, there are certain people in certain firms that really, really want this report. It's not quite as exciting to everybody else like you and me, I suppose, but there are certain people for whom that report is extremely, uh, extremely valuable. Now, um, how do you get it? How much does it cost? How do you find out how much it costs? Well, let's just say it's not cheap. Uh, that's about all I can say without knowing who's asking and what they have. It has a lot to do with what version you're currently on. It has a lot to do with what you have, how many timekeepers you have. Do you have the accounting software? Do you have Practice Master? And uh, until we know those things, we can't get you a price. So what's the easiest way to get a price for an upgrade to Platinum? Just shoot me an email, Paul at paulpurdue.com, and it's Purdue like the chicken, not the school. I'm, I, did I say that? Purdue like the school, not the chicken. So it's P-U-R-D-U-E, Paul at Paul Purdue, P-A-U-L at P-A-U-L-P-U-R-D-U-E.com. Okay. So that's that. We learned about uh, EFTs for those people that have been struggling with the old-fashioned way. This is a, a huge difference. And we learned about platinum. Uh, next month, we're going to talk about changing how a check has been applied in tabs after the fact. We all know, in fact, we just saw it when we watched Mary Jo make that transaction, that one of the last things that's uh, done when you're entering a check into a cost table is that you get to jump over to tabs and put it on somebody's bill. What happens when you get it on the wrong bill or you get the wrong amount in there or you get the description wrong or you, you need to get back in and do that? Through AP, how do you do that? Because you want to maintain that that integrity, and and Mary Jo will be talking about that. I am going to talk about fee compensation rules, the rules that you can set up in tabs to help divvy up the money based on who originated the case, based on uh, a lot of different things. So we'll be talking about that as well. And of course, it wouldn't be the end of a virtual user group meeting if I didn't take you to Attorney Computer Systems. Dot com, of course, with an emphasis on that last F in systems right there, attorneycomputersystems.com, because once you get there, you can highlight our video tab and see all of our three virtual user group meetings, plus our coffee pot webinar. So these four are live events, the tabs, Practice Master and World Docs virtual user group meetings, plus my monthly coffee pot webinars. You'll also find information about Mary Jo's eBytes video series and the Paul and Mary Jo show to pre-recorded uh, video offerings. And so if you want to find out what's going on for the next Tabs Free Virtual User Group meeting, you can just click there and, uh-oh, <laughs> Patty's in there doing something. Um, we'll blame Patty. Interesting. Okay, so we have a problem on our website there. So we instead will take you into our Practice Master Virtual User Group meeting and keep our fingers crossed. There we go. Where you will see information about the next meeting, which is actually in about ooh, 29 minutes, links to register. Um, and as you scroll down, you will see pre, uh, recorded versions of the last 
and a whole slew of virtual user group meetings or webinars. So our Coffee Pot webinars, our Tabs 3, our Practice Master, and our World Docs virtual user group meetings are all live events that you can access that way, see what's coming up, see what's been done. Occasionally, you'll see one at the top that says currently in post-production, and that just means we're and we're in that week or two period between when we had the event and when Brad, our video producer, gets done putting it in a state where it can be brought up to the website. We also, of course, have our pre-recorded things. Uh, Mary Jo just recorded a whole slew of e-bytes this morning. Those are little short three, four minute snippets, one recorded each month for Practice Master, one for Tabs, and one for Worldbox. And we also have the Paul and Mary Jo show where either I or Mary Jo will take a broader topic and dig deep into it, taking 10, 15, 20, sometimes longer minutes uh, to get really to the meat of an issue and explain it. So that's it. Everybody have a good rest of the afternoon and a uh, good month, and we will see you next week. Thanks much. Bye-bye.